Using the internet or our phone, we can send any congratulations in a second, but it was impossible before. Christmas postcards were the only way to pass the warmest words, Merry Christmas, to a loved one thousands of kilometers away. This story, of course, about a Christmas miracle. A miracle of competent investment. How a shilling could be turned into 20,000 pounds. Winter England of the early 19th century was full of festive excitement. Merry Christmas was heard from everywhere, the strict tradition to oblige to visit all relatives personally, and accompanying the exchange of courtesies with long congratulatory letters. For the official Sir Henry Cole, the first director of the London Museum of Victoria and Albert, it was a big headache. Wondering how to congratulate all in one fell swoop, Henry shared a problem with his friend, artist John Horsley. Without thinking twice, the illustrator suggested making small pictures depicting the Cole couple and all their children at a Christmas dinner. Firstly, they will appear in absentia in all houses. Secondly, a small format of the image itself will limit the size of the letter. Did Cole dare such an adventure? You bet! The sketch was made from life. In the centre of the picture, there was the family of Sir Henry Cole at the table, and next to it the inscription, Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. By the coming 1840, Sir Henry had sent the pictures to his friends and acquaintances. People didn't just like the author's cards, they were proud of them and kept as a great value. Then Cole thought that the idea could bring a good profit. In 1843, he printed 1,000 copies from the original, each postcard costing a shilling. It was a large sum at those times. He was sure that interest in postcards was just a temporary fashion. He was wrong. Very soon, everybody started buying them. Since 1860, they were mass-produced. After 160 years, at one of the auctions in the city of Wiltshire, Henry Cole's shilling postcard was sold for £20,000. It was one of the first postcards intended for his grandmother. Of course, Sir Henry himself couldn't get this huge return on investments. But we hope he knows how people of the whole world praised his idea, with the desire to congratulate all dear people on Christmas in one fell swoop. A smokescreen will make any show spectacular. Soil fertilization improves the harvest. No one can do without matches. All these are assisted by phosphorus. How did it get into our lives? It may have been discovered by a magician, because without special effects, his illusions were not very exciting. Or being hopelessly in love, a young man may have been trying to impress his beloved. You cannot guess. The most important role was played by the Philosopher's Stone. In 1669, Hamburg chemist Hennig Brand worked on the creation of a Philosopher's Stone, a substance that turns any metal into gold. Hennig came up with an interesting idea. As urine is golden in colour, it contains gold. He began to evaporate it. The smell in the room must have been disgusting. However, after boiling, there was no gold on the bottom of the retort. There were white grains. Hennig had no idea what it was. In the evening, he noticed that the grains glowed in the dark. In the 17th century, it was an unprecedented miracle. Of course, Hennig Brand took advantage of this. He began to show phosphorus to the rich, receiving gifts and money in return. The article, The Method of Preparing Phosphorus from Human Urine, was published in 1693. Is modern phosphorus produced in such an unpleasant way? Fortunately, it isn't. In 1715, a biologist discovered phosphorus in the human brain tissue but they didn't kill people to extract phosphorus. So even 30 years later, scientists continued to work on the recipe with urine. In 1777, it finally happened. Phosphorus was found in the horns and bones of animals. After that, it was discovered in the Earth's crust and marine sedimentary rocks. An acceptable way to extract phosphorus was found, 
But how did the history of the Philosopher's Stone end? The dream didn't become a reality. However, thanks to his wonderful and fascinating venture, Hennig Brand got rich. While entertaining people with luminous phosphorus, he was generously paid. Though in the end he was tired of entertaining, he sold the technology of obtaining phosphorus. Hennig Brand realised the dream. He created his own philosophical stone, which led him to gold. What do a man who utters a toast at a New Year's party, a businessman who has closed a good deal, and a race driver who won the Grand Prix of Formula One have in common? They all raise glasses of champagne, the drink you can't imagine a real celebration without. What occasion did champagne appear at for the first time? One day, Marie Antoinette arranged a dinner party where the guests were offered a fermented wine with bubbles. They were feared for their heads, so they didn't dare tell the Queen. Since then, champagne was served for every festivity. That may have happened, but a hundred years before Marie Antoinette, there was a man who revealed champagne to the whole world. However, it was exactly what he didn't want. In 1668, a young monk, Pierre Perignon, settled in the Abbey of Saint-Pierre de Hauvillers in Champagne. In those days, monks not only prayed and cast out demons, but also made wine. So Pierre began to master the occupation. He ran into a problem. In the spring, barrels of wine suddenly began to explode. It turned out that the geography was to blame for everything. It was quite cold in the province of Champagne. Because of that, there was little time left to produce wine, and it was placed in barrels before the fermentation completed. The sealed wine released carbon dioxide, so the bubbles made the barrels explode. Perignon realised that the French climate would not change. Then he discovered the secrets of mixing wines, started to pour them into bottles instead of exploding barrels, and even invented a plug made out of cork bark. The only thing that he never could do was get rid of the bubbles. It happened contrary to Perignon's plans. Clients of the Abbey, among whom was the royal court, suddenly fell in love with the spoiled drink and the sparkling wine from Champagne began its procession all over the world. No, Pierre Perignon didn't invent Champagne, and he wouldn't be happy to learn how popular it would become. But the persistent bubbles know no bounds in the modern world. Today, Champagne fizzes in the name of all our victories and celebrations, as well as yours. No, it's not a birthday party and we're not even celebrating an anniversary release of the program. Today we're going to tell you about something that creates a special atmosphere without a reason. About fireworks, loud and beautiful. The appearance of the first fireworks must have frightened lots of people, as explosions in the sky could scare anyone. Not only did the fireworks terrify people, they were also occult weapons. Immortal life. That's what the alchemists of the past tried to create. Monks at the court of the Han Dynasty in 206 to 220 BC were no exception. Out of people's sight in their cells, they were looking for the elixir of immortality. That time, everything should have worked out. The success was so close. A little sulfate, charcoal, sulfur, ignite. The search for the immortality pill failed but the phenomenon was so beautiful that the monks were not upset. At least if you can't make life endless, such a substance can make it more interesting. The restless alchemists knew that all the Chinese scared off evil spirits with bamboo. The shoots of the plant were thrown into the fire. There they heated up, crackled and exploded with a loud pop. People were afraid of these pops, and the spirits obviously ran away. If our mixture was so explosive, what will happen if we put it inside bamboo sticks, they wondered. Filled with the mixture and ignited, a bamboo stick flew up into the sky and exploded. It was the first fireworks display. Later, it was them that came up with the idea to replace the bamboo with thick paper and began to tie a rag fuse to the stick. 
Initially, the invention was used only during festivities and religious ceremonies. Fireworks both scared and attracted local people. But in the 13th century, they were used in military battles. Loud air shells frightened enemies and horses. A new impulse to the development of the firework business was given by the traveller Marco Polo. In 1300, he brought fireworks from China to Italy. It was the Italians who developed the waterfall, palm, Bengal lights and Roman candles. People around the world have long ceased to be afraid of coloured fires. But the evil forces as before for sure ran away without looking back.